Hello everyone welcome to a new video. This is a start of a new series, what if Naruto had Wolverine's power? Enjoy, first seal, assault, the pain was fading, that was certain enough, but it was fading slowly. As the boy, bruised and beaten, cut in several places by sheer impact trauma, forced his one good eye open, and that only halfway from the swelling on his face, he could feel the slight burn as his body healed, again. Every year this happened, every October 10th a mob came looking for him, and the beatings were getting worse especially as he continued to recover. He was lifted gently by a pair of arms belonging to an Anbu in a dog mask, and the familiar jolt and bounce of a shinobi running as fast as he could began. He was heading to the hospital again, he knew. The Hokage would be there, as soon as he found out, but why couldn't he stop it from happening in the first place? The blonde boy didn't know who was doing this to him, and the people who did get caught somehow mysteriously walked free within hours with all charges dropped. He was in so much pain sometimes that he almost wished it would all stop. But then he'd hear a vague and somewhat shy giggle in the back of his mind, a soft voice that he could never quite place saying something he could never remember, and he would drag himself back up and fight for his life. Even now, when his very blood was leaving a clear trail showing the ANBU's progress, as the boy slipped into unconsciousness, he'd recall vaguely the girl, that much he was sure of, and his attacking the bullies who'd cornered her. He'd lost of course, but he'd fought them hard, drawing their attention, and luring them, away from their first target. Some days, he wished he could remember who she was, but the five boys had beaten him harshly, even if he'd given well nigh as good as he got. The girl's minder had shown up and bought the bully's story that Naruto had been bothering the girl, and delivered a strike to the boy's head, ignoring the protest of the girl. As she'd knelt beside him that day, he'd heard her apologizing, thanking him for saving her, before being dragged away. The doctors and nurses at the hospital were indifferent to the boy. As long as the Anbu was watching they did their jobs, but the second he left to report to the Hokage, they left him in a room alone, to die, or live, as he had a distressing tendency to survive. The boy had heard the hate-filled epithets they muttered at him before, and though they puzzled him, he had long since grown a nerd to them. It was not living he was doing now, it was surviving. He'd made up his mind that he would be Hokage one day, and he would manage it, if only for her. The white-haired young medic Nin looked at the boy's chart. The way this Uzumaki brat was healing was incredibly rapid, almost unnatural. Maybe he could use that to find a cure for his master's disciple. It would take a lot of planning, but if it worked. Naruto opened his sapphire blue eyes to see a ceiling that had been spattered with something brown, almost black in some places. To one side, he could see a table with silvery instruments arrayed upon it, and two men discussing some kind of notes. He was firmly secured to the table, and to the other side, if he twisted his eyes far enough, he could make out another table with someone strapped to it. Even as he watched, he saw the taller and skinnier man, who had strange yellow eyes, collect a shard of what looked like bone from the other person's chest. Since there were no screams, the other person must have been unconscious. As the two upright figures stood over him, the taller one spoke in a voice that seemed designed to give people the creeps. Oh, good, you're awake, he said, smiling sadistically. This experiment is most likely going to hurt a little. The searing pain as the shorter man opened the flesh of Naruto's chest with a scalpel and quickly cracked the sternum caused the boy to scream in agony. And he hadn't screamed when the mob had come for him. The taller man inserted the shard of bone into the fracture in Naruto's breastbone, and the two men then sewed the wound shut. Over the next few days, this is going to hurt a little more, the snake-eyed man explained. Either you'll survive, in which case you might be useful, or you'll die, and we can dissect you to see what went wrong. It's a win-win situation, for me. As the blonde boy, barely nine years old, drifted into the oblivion of unconsciousness once more, the experiment began. The shinobi of Konoha were mobilized by the order of the Hokage, and sent out to find Naruto within minutes of the boy being reported missing. Since that didn't happen until the Anbu in the dog mask stopped by the hospital at noon the next day, the chances of finding him were significantly reduced. A great many ninja didn't put much effort into the search, wanting nothing to do with the demon child, not that they said it in as many words, of course. But if an Inazuka, overlooked, a sent here until the trail was cold, or a Hyuga or Uchiha, forgot, to activate their dujutsu there, who could prove otherwise? And as for the few who actively concealed evidence, well, the root program had been shut down, so they couldn't possibly exist, could they? The boy had lost track of so much time. As bone shards were inserted all over his body, one at a time, he was hurt more and more, he got weaker, his senses shut down, in short, he was dying. The snake-eyed man, called Orochimaru-sama by his subordinates, watched. The experiment was failing. Kimimaro could no longer afford to donate bone shards. If it hadn't been for the blonde brat's marrow, injected directly into his bones, Kimimaro would have been useless long ago. These reports had the brat healing well for the first few weeks, but then his bones had begun their breakdown. 
At this point, the boy was a burden on their resources. Ironically, much like the Konoha medics, the researchers here relegated the boy to some out-of-the-way corner to die. Naruto knew he was dying. It was hard not to as his hearing dulled, his eyesight dimmed and his sense of smell and taste shut down. The very act of moving too fast was enough to break bones now, and too fast was any motion quicker than a slow, time-consuming crawl. Since he was of little other use, the researchers had attempted to strengthen his failing bones with that silvery, chakra-conductive metal, but with little effect. In fact, the malaise that seemed to be breaking the boy down was corroding the metal implants, breaking them down and whisking them away through his bloodstream. Now all he could do was wait for death. As he closed his eyes one more time, uncertain if they'd ever open again, he saw that vague silhouette of that girl, and wished he at least knew who she was. It had been three months since Naruto disappeared. No one was looking anymore, except the white-haired old spymaster Jiraiya. He'd even given up writing to search, a fact that depressed the former Anbu called Hitaki Kakashi. But he was the only one allowed to look, by order of the council. It hadn't been a unanimous vote, but for some reason the edict had gone out. The Toad Sage had spent a week lamenting the fact that his information network in his home village was underdeveloped, say rather, non-existent, and had then thrown himself into both building it up and investigating the disappearance. In a move uncharacteristic for him, the legendary super pervert even eschewed his research in favor of these tasks and did not like the results, or rather, the lack of them. Someone was sabotaging his efforts. The academy took in its next class in another three months, and most of the prospective students couldn't care less about this whole mess. A number of them were even glad that the incorrigible prankster was gone. But there was one little girl who looked around shyly, searching for him with her pale, moon-like eyes and quietly crying at his absence. Every day, in the corner of her garden, she would open a bento box and put out enough lunch for a person to eat, remembering a boy who had saved her. It was ironic, in a way, that the very neglect that threatened Naruto's life, the wasting of his bones, led to his salvation. Deep inside the seal on his belly, a seal none had seen for the boy could not channel chakra yet, nor mold it to any purpose, the Kayubi no Yoko took note of its jailer's plight. In the boy's weakened state it was easy to see the seal that trapped the biju within him, at least from here in Naruto's mindscape, and the effects were going to carry both boy and beast into the afterlife. Spiteful as he could be, the demon fox wanted to live a lot more than he wanted revenge on his prison. Of course, he couldn't reach past the seal to do much without the damn thing triggering. All he could do was send out his chakra in a blind attempt to heal the boy, and he didn't know enough about humans for it to do any good. On top of that were the several shards of foreign bone in the boy, and the tissue rejection issues they were causing, as well as the boy's general shutdown. Fortunately, perhaps, the Kayubi could feel he wasn't alone in here. The seal held two more segments of chakra, suppressed and contained for specific triggers. He could feel these triggers, and knew how to set them off, and those chakra signatures wouldn't trip the seal's fail-safes. He just had to do this right, stretching out with the thickest strand of his demonic chakra he could manage without tripping the seal, the fox gently eased the boy into his mindscape, a vast, sewer-like construction with a single incongruous ray of sunlight. Usually, the thing was overflowing with stagnant water, but in Naruto's current state of mind, it was blood, thick and black. Although Naruto was shocked and scared when he saw the Kayubi, he was truly beyond caring what happened to him. Wake up, boy, the demon rumbled, its words appearing in Naruto's strained mind without passing through his ears, or don't you want to find out who the girl is? Struggling to stand, the blonde boy leaned against the bars. I'm dying, looks like I go to Jigoku if I'm seeing the fox that the Yandaimi Hokage killed. He was too hurt to flinch as the killing intent of the Kayubi washed through him. Kill me, he roared, that man barely had the power to seal me, and he was the strongest leader your village had ever seen. Shaking his head, the demon fox pushed his temper aside, living was more important at the moment. Boy, if you want to live, you're going to have to pull down that seal. That will release what you need to survive. It seemed a simple enough proposition, even to Naruto, but the very simplicity made it suspect. And if I don't, then we both die and your village will probably fall in as little as five years, the Kayubi replied, pulling a wild guess from thin air. His eyes narrowed as he went for the weak spot, including that cute little vixen you can never quite recall. That did the trick. Naruto reached up with the full intent to shred that seal, and found his wrist caught by a man who greatly resembled the Yandaimi. The demon fox didn't even pause for breath or to let the man speak as he extended a tendril of his power towards the boy, commanding as he did so. Master it, boy, take it inside you and claim it. Without thinking, Naruto attempted that very thing, even as a confused-looking Yandaimi glared at the fox. The effort smashed the boy's conscious mind deeper into oblivion, even as a red-haired woman appeared. The last he knew of anything was the fox's voice. We don't have time, he and by extension that means me as well, we're dying. 
I have the power to fix it, but can't reach beyond the seal, and don't know how. The two of you can, and may just know enough. Had anyone thought to check, they might have noticed the boy sweating and curling into a ball, racked with pain as red chakra surged through him in a curiously controlled manner, supercharging his immune system and laying hold of any material it could use to rebuild him. His senses were rebuilt, sharper than ever, more potent, sight and sound and scent. His bones were strengthened and healed, stronger than ever, shifted around as Kimimaro's Keke Jenke was assimilated in a unique manner, as claws, blades of bone stronger than tempered steel, grew within his arms, and the muscles and nerves surrounding them shifted to facilitate their use. The bones were further strengthened as the remnants of the chakra conductive metal were retrieved from within his system, and plated onto and tempered with his bones. The last and possibly most essential phase was the enhancement of the Keke Jenke of the Uzumaki line, the unknown factor that allowed them to heal quickly, and resist diseases and poisons, as well as maintain a lifespan at least half again that of others. This would mean his wounds would heal impossibly fast, and his immune system would vastly increase, rendering him almost immune to toxins and illness. As the chakra infusions that were all that was left of Namikaze Minato and Uzumaki Kashina faded, the Yandaimis echo turned to the demon fox. You've only got three hours, use them well, and get him to somewhere or someone safe if you can. He then suppressed the seal as he faded away, smiling at Kashina, sacrificing themselves for their son a second time. It was perhaps fortunate for Orochimaru that he, Kimimaro and his top spy from Konoha were not present when this happened. Over the course of two hours, every living creature in the base that was not a prisoner was used to paint the walls a most horrific shade of red, and then, leaving a number of dazed and terrified former experiments and prisoners behind, although in Orochimaru's strongholds the difference was negligible. The creature that had slaughtered so many tore across the countryside at top speed. Senju Tsunade glared at the dice before her. The hard sixes. Six times, she'd rolled, asking the proprietor if someone might have swapped out her dice for loaded ones. No one else who'd rolled them had managed to score the highest hand in the game. One more time she picked the dice up, all six of them, dropping them one by one into the cup, rattling it hard, and casting them. Again, the six dice all showed the same face the circle of six dots representing a crown. Pushing her winnings across the table, along with her case of IOUs, she asked a favor of the house. Could you see that these debts get paid off, please? She requested, slightly shocking her apprentice Shizun. If my luck is holding true to form, I may not live to. Gathering the rest of her things, including a purse containing a modest sum, as compared to the massive pile of Rio she'd left inside, she immediately began to leave town, with Shizun pushing herself to keep up, with no idea what was about to happen. The savage creature that was, to all outward appearances, a nine-year-old boy, raced through the forest and the storm as though the very hounds of the hells were at his heels. Where he could, he simply forced his way through, and where he was blocked. His new claws made sure that he was not blocked for long. The fox that was riding his mind, guiding him through instinct, could feel the seal beginning to close, and had little desire to collapse for what would be years to him and wake up as a pile of wild animal droppings. So he pushed the boy's body harder, as if by sheer will he could get him somewhere safe heading by instinct closer to Konohagakure no Sato. When he burst out of the shrubbery onto the road, which he had not expected, he paused for a critical moment as he turned to assess where he was, and heard a pair of voices gasp in unison, and a pig squeal in fear. Focusing on the travelers he just startled, or terrorized, whatever word worked best. He saw a tall blonde woman with an oversized pair of breasts, she smelled older than she looked, for some reason, and a shorter black-haired woman with a more modest figure holding a panicking piglet. Then the seal slammed shut, and Naruto's face eased back from the savage snarl into a puzzled look, as he collapsed in the street. Tsunade stared at the boy who'd leapt from the bushes at the roadside, far too exhausted to notice them until too late. She could see the scars fading as what remained of serious wounds healed before her very eyes, in seconds rather than weeks. His clothes, what remained of them, had once been hospital issue, but were now little more than decorative ribbons. He looked familiar, too, as though she'd seen him somewhere before. She shook her head as she took in the last detail, the most surprising. The blades that emerged from his hands, three on each, each a good eight inches long and from what she could see, sharp as a razor. A keke jenke, perhaps? The blades seemed to be metal, too, that chakra-sensitive alloy that some shinobi used for their weapons. Still, he was a boy, and unconscious. Sighing, she picked him up, and stroked the muscles of his arms like a cat's paws, hoping the blades would retract. They did, and the queen of slugs and elixirs turned to her apprentice. We'd better set up camp for the night, Shizun. We're not going to get far now. As they stepped from the road, Tsunade increased the chakra flow to her muscles a fraction. From the weight of the boy, she'd guess that his entire skeleton was that bone metal amalgam, and that his muscles were sturdier to handle the extra mass. The little gaki was heavy. 
Naruto opened his eyes, and immediately regretted it. They were extremely sensitive, and the sunlight he stared up into was painfully bright until they adjusted. Rubbing at his eyes as he rolled to face away from the sky, he learned his muscles were incredibly sore. The pain was fading, almost completely gone in fact, but there was a residual ache that was slow to depart. He could hear breathing from nearby, and looked in that direction. Over ten feet away, the two women, looking vaguely familiar, he didn't have much recall of how he got here, were sitting by a small fire, discussing something in some scroll they were looking at. As he lifted himself, absently noticing he was heavier than he remembered, they looked in his direction. Their voices were incredibly loud to his ears, and he covered both with his hands to filter the noises. The old one who didn't look it smelled overwhelmingly of sake, and the other had some rather acrid sense about her. It looked like this would be quite the challenge. Jiraiya was following a lead. Somewhere out in this direction was one of Orochimaru's little strongholds, and it was in this direction that his meager clues brought him. As he trudged along, he came to a gambling den where he overheard an interesting snippet of conversation. So there she was, all night, casting the worst hands possible at any given time, and she's about to chuck it in as a bad lot when Kudama eggs her into putting everything she's got left on the hard sixes. She goes him one better and calls hard sixes by seven, apparently figuring if she won she could clear her debts, but if she lost, it wasn't like she'd owe us any more. The speaker was a rough-looking gambler type with a case of IOUs and another filled with money, gradually dispensing the latter to the proper claims of the former as he spoke. Please, bear in mind this is the legendary sucker. As the other gamblers chuckled, Jiraiya frowned. Tsunade was out this way as well? That was quite a coincidence. He returned his attention to the gambler's story. So, yeah, Kudama covers it, figuring it's a sure thing, and puts his stake all in. Then she casts them, seven times. The hard sixes, the ring of crowns, whatever you want to call it. She frowns a bit, and casts twice more. Same thing, and Kudama's about to call her for cheating when she passes me the dice and asks if someone switched them out. Beats him to it. So of course I send them round the table once, and they're just regular dice. Even Kudama gets them, and double checks them. So she gets the dice back and throws again and again and again. Now she's really staring at the dice, glaring at them almost, and she throws her last hand. Hard sixes. She's won, and asks me to see to her debts. Kudama insists she's got to be using loaded dice and points at her as she's leaving, and an extra set of dice falls out of his sleeve. Now everyone sees how suspicious that is, so I pick up the dice on the table and cast. Sure enough they're loaded, for all the ones. Seems Kudama switched them when he was looking them over. So we had Oniyama take him out back to, discuss things with him. As the gamblers laughed riotously, the toad sage calmly walked away, at least to outward appearances. No one knew better than he how Tsunade's luck ran. If she'd scored such a massive win, her life was most likely in danger. Breaking into a run, he chased her rumored path from the village. Naruto stared at the claws that extended from his hand. After explaining where they'd found him, or rather, he'd found them, they had told him of what they'd seen. He'd always healed quickly, if not this fast, and he'd rapidly learned how to focus his senses, from self-defense if nothing else, but they'd had to help coax the three blades from his arm. There was a particular muscular twist to it, and a similar one to retract them, and of course, he had to want them to do so. A moment's testing was all they needed to determine that yes, his bones were all melded with the silvery chakra conductive metal that now laced them. It presented an interesting idea for a shinobi to have weapons that couldn't be taken away from them, but in most such cases rejection issues clouded what was possible. As the three packed up their camp, the older lady, Tsunade, spoke. I can't believe we forgot to ask, Gaki, she apologized, sort of. What's your name, Naruto, he replied, handing Shizune the folded bedding to place in a storage seal. Uzumaki Naruto. He realized, falsely, that these two nice women wouldn't want to travel with him anymore, and sighed as the Sanin lady stiffened, which to his young mind confirmed his guess. If you could just point the way to Konoha, I'll get out of your hair, sorry to bother you. He lost what he was trying to say as Tsunade grabbed his shoulders and began investigating his face. Yes, her features were there, a little harder at the edges, mixed with the father's, and with that blonde mop, there was only one person that could be. Seeing the fear start to rise in his face she loosened her grip as she crouched, talking with him on an eye-to-eye -eye level. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, it's just. I knew your mother, when I heard she was killed, I was told her child, her son, didn't survive, that he'd been killed by the Kayubi. A vague image rose in Naruto's mind, the three figures he'd seen last night, working together. The Kayubi providing the chakra, the redhead focusing it and the Yandaimi directing it, into him. He didn't know who they were, but from what the Hokage had said to him, they were probably his parents. He couldn't picture anyone else, with a handful of exceptions including these two nice ladies, who cared enough to save him. He was about to speak when a sudden explosion of smoke burst in front of them and an old white-haired man in red and green, 
standing on the back of an outsized toad appeared, beginning to loudly proclaim himself, hurting the boy's ears. Jiraiya had spotted the boy, and with the two women distracted, had decided on a fine prank to get back in the swing of his normal routine. As he appeared he began his speech, hoping to impress Naruto and tick off Tsunade, just a little. Attend, he cried, striking a pose on the back of Gamatoro, one of the battle toads of Mount Myoboku. I am the mighty toad. Sage. His planned speech was cut short as Naruto flicked his arms outward and his claws sprang forth with a meaty, snicked. By instinct, the boy crossed the blades across his chest, guarding his vitals as he watched the intruder. He was worried, but if these nice ladies were in trouble, he'd help them. Not that it seemed necessary as Tsunade gritted out the newcomer's name, in pieces. Jiraiya, she said, almost sweetly if you could ignore the grinding teeth behind it. As he glanced in her direction, she hit him, driving him hard across the clearing until he hit a tree on the far side. We just got him calmed down you old fool, she hissed in the aftermath as Naruto put his claws away, making the mental note not to piss her off unless he really had to. Explaining things to Jiraiya took time, especially when they hadn't heard Naruto's side of the story yet. Horrified by what had happened to him, Jiraiya came to a decision fairly rapidly once all their stories were told. What Naruto hadn't been able to understand, however was something far more basic. Lady Tsunade, he said, respect for someone that strong was a good thing. He thought, if you were told I was dead, and he knew I was alive, why didn't you two ever compare notes? Why didn't one of you, since you both knew my parents, make sure I was okay? Jiraiya cast his mind back, striving to recall every time the subject of Naruto's well-being had come up. He could recall talking to his old sensei, the Sandame Hokage, but there was more. Someone else was always there. A man with a heavily bandaged arm and face. Shimura Danzo. Why, he didn't know, but it was very suspicious. Naruto, I was always told you were doing fine, he explained. I trusted the man who told me that, and perhaps I shouldn't have, but that was my mistake. I don't know how I'm going to make it up to you, though. He paused a moment. I have a plan. I'm the only one left looking for you, Naruto, so I can pretend to keep searching throwing people off the scent. It was mostly luck I found you this time anyway. If Lady Tsunade is willing, would you like to get some early training for the academy from her in Shizun? The Toad Sage was pointedly ignoring the glares from his old teammate at this point. Sighing, Tsunade turned to the boy. Truth be told, he was safer out here with her than he was in Konoha for now. Maybe they could figure out what had happened to him, and why his abilities were so far enhanced. I'm happy to teach you if you want, Naruto, she agreed deciding to pass the first part of his training off on Shizun. But I'm not sure how much you can learn before the academy starts. Nodding, Jiraiya spoke up again. I'll report to the old man that you're taking him under your wing after finding him, to help him recover from the after-effects of Orochimaru's experiments. I guess we can just thank our lucky stars that our former teammate didn't realize what he had in Naruto. Once he's up to par, you'll send word, and I'll come and bring him home. Does that sound good? The adults all nodded, and Naruto put his chin in his hand as he thought. I guess, I'm going to miss Ichiraku Ramen, though, the Sandame Hokage, Sarutobi Hirazan, the professor, the god of Shinobi, sat staring at Jiraiya's mission report, before destroying it with a quick, localized fire jutsu. Danzo would never find out about this if he had anything to do with it. Turning to his former student, he asked a question he'd been dreading. Your opinion? Jiraiya leaned against the wall. Physically, the kid's fine. A little traumatized by the experiments old snake lips performed, but Tsunade can handle that. The effects that resulted? No idea. I found the stronghold afterwards, and I'm fairly sure that the kid doesn't even realize what happened to the guards and researchers there. It's possible his, traveling companion, dealt with them for him, but then why would it release him? He shook his head, too many questions there, including, why didn't the Kyubi kill the other victims? Returning to the topic at hand he chuckled. You should have seen him, sensei, he said, the way he lit up when he heard that he'd be getting a head start on the academy. At least he'll be on par with some of the clan ta cadets. But then there's those claws. Have you ever heard of a keke jenke involving bones or metal before? Hiruzen stroked his pointed beard. Metal? There's the Bayaku clan in Kumo, maybe, but I think they're just gifted weaponsmiths. As for bone, there was the Kagaya clan in Mizu no Kuni, but they were wiped out in the bloodline purges. If there's even one left, I'd be surprised. He was even more thoughtful. If this new trait became a Keke Jenke, that would mean Naruto had two bloodline limits. No one else in Konoha had that. It had been tried, of course, and back in the Nidem Hokage's reign there had been an ill-fated romance between a Hyuga girl and an Uchiha boy. Sadly all their children had been born blind, so both clans had passed laws, as had the village, prohibiting children from such unions. 
If anyone found out about it, the blasted village council, the civilian side at least, would try to enforce that cursed CRA, the Clan Restoration Act. Here is in thought the end of that acronym lacked a T. They'd slipped it into existence between the death of the Yandiming and his taking the reins again, and he didn't have the support to overturn it, yet. If he could get all the shinobi clans and a few civilians on his side, it would be another matter. Lifting his head, he turned to the window as he spoke. I'm trying to see a way out of this, but I'm walking in the dark, he whispered. His former student grinned. So let's start a fire, he replied. Orochimaru stared at the charred ruins that had once been one of his strongholds. It was utterly destroyed for his purposes now. As he'd explored the facility before putting it to the torch, he had to admit that whoever had done this had a certain flair for decorating. He giggled as he stepped over body parts. From some of the damage, if he hadn't known any better, he'd have sworn that he'd turned Kimimaro loose on the place. No survivors, and all prisoners slash experimental subjects had been liberated. Oh, well, time for a change of scenery anyway, he said as he set off towards the north, and Ta no Kuni. The next Chunin exams in Konoha are in three years, and I need my pieces in place by then. Hinata was miserable. Her father was a strict man, unbending at times, but he'd been forced to it by the deaths of his twin in that mess when she was three. And then his wife, her mother from complications following the birth of Hanabi, her little sister. The division in the Hyuga clan didn't help anything, either, and even her cousin Neji was disdainful of her weakness. Since that day long ago, she'd secretly spied on the blonde boy who'd taken the beating of those bullies for her, while she wished she'd been able to help him. Even if she just distracted one, she felt it would have been enough, that Naruto would have managed to take the other four and then. She was interrupted in her musings by her sister's demands to fight her. Hanabi was proving something of a prodigy, and was easily able to defeat her big sister in the sparring matches. Mostly because she refused to accept the gentle touches Hinata used as the nigh-crippling blows they would have been with Chakra behind them. The elders seemed to back the younger girl's arrogance. It was almost as if they wanted the children of Hiyashi to cripple one another. And Neji had been caught up in a fatalistic display, always going on about fate, this, and destiny, that. It was depressing. Even if Hinata were to use the full force of the gentle fist, she knew exactly where that would get her. The elders would accuse her of trying to cripple her sister, and cast doubt on her suitability as the heiress that way. Sighing, she went to lose again. Kakashi stood by the memorial stone, staring at a number of names he knew well, all dead and gone. Namikaze Minato, his sensei, died sealing the Kayubi, and his wife Uzumaki Kashina with him, holding down the demon fox so he could. Uchiha Obito, his best friend and the source of his sharing Ganai, died protecting his team on a mission that had gone bad. Nohara Rin, his other teammate, a strong medic nin and a girl he might have married, died at his hand rather than destroy the village when the sambi that was sealed into her broke free. There were many others. He dreaded having to put the names of cadets up there, but it happened. The Hokage had asked him to assess graduating teams with an eye towards shinobi work, and he knew that he would accept nothing less than the best. Looking at the two bells in his hand, he set off towards the academy. The weeks passed slowly, and Naruto grew stronger. His teachers had introduced him to chakra manipulation, and he'd taken to it like a duck to water. Reading and writing lessons saw him more reluctant, but Tsunade had made him a deal, get it all to her standard by the time they got back to Konoha, and she'd buy him all he could eat at that Ichiraku ramen place. So the blonde knucklehead was motivated to study. As the lessons progressed, he found his chakra control was iffy. His massive reserves were the most likely cause of this, he was told. It was like the difference between damming a creek, and damming a river. You needed more for the river than the creek, so his progress there would be slow. It might take years to master and they had other lessons. His control wasn't fine enough for medical jutsu, so they taught him what they could of the basic procedures of emergency medicine that didn't need his chakra. While Shizun started him off to find a taijutsu style that suited him, preferably one that adapted well to his claws, and left room for his potential keke jenke, if he turned out to have one. But those claws hadn't come from nowhere. Tsunade researched his changes as best she could. Naruto learned a lot from the two medical kunoichi. Jiraiya visited on occasion, when he happened to be in the area, and he started Naruto on the basics of what he said was his father's specialty, not that he mentioned him by name. He told the disappointed boy that only three people had the right to tell him, and he wasn't one of them, Fuenjutsu, the art of sealing. It was a lot of theory, involved math, and the study of symbols, but by the time Naruto returned to Konoha, he could manage a small storage seal. Naruto began to suspect that his abduction may have been the best thing that ever happened to him and then he remembered the pain. Not even the village's annual mob had inflicted anywhere near that level of pain and agony upon him. Jiraiya looked on as Tsunade counted out the boy's share of the group's cash, which she then placed in a storage seal that he put in a pocket. Jiraiya looked at the boy's loud orange outfit, too, and shook his head. 
Do you really think it's possible to be stealthy in that outfit? He asked. The outfit in question was a pair of pants and jacket over a mesh shirt. I mean, really, kid, orange? Naruto had had time to think on this one. What color's a tiger, Arrow Senen? He'd caught the old man riding one night and peeked over his shoulder. His cry of lost innocence had brought the other Sanin and her apprentice running, shortly before Jiraiya decided he should be running, and the nickname had been coined, and stuck. As the boy waved goodbye to Shizun and Tsunade, the toad sage paused to think. That dark blue on the jacket, the black undershirt, even the lines on the pants, all served to break up the orange outline. On top of that, from what he could see, the outfit was reversible. Damn it, he cursed to himself. The boy was right. Oh, he was going to be a real menace. He'd have to listen to his new network in Konoha very closely, just to hear about the pranks. Hinata sat on a bench just inside the gates of Konoha, well within the view of the gate guards and her minder for the day, a branch family Hyuga by the name of Ko. She wasn't happy about the man, who seemed determined to deny her enjoyment in anything. It had been he that had struck a certain boy in the head for daring to defend her from bullies, and he'd smiled as he did it, knowing the boys had been lying. As it was she was practicing with her Bayakugan, gradually building up how long she could hold it active for, and counting the birds in the trees beyond the gates. Thus it was she who first saw the approaching pair, an old man with spiky white hair, and a boy with spiky blonde hair. They were playing some kind of word game as they walked, at the same time bouncing a ball back and forth between them. As her vision focused in closer, she saw the features of the old man, but couldn't recognize him. The boy on the other hand, Naruto was back, the Hyuga heiress went bright red and fainted, and he wasn't even in the village yet. Hyuga Ko was watching his charge as she practiced the bird counting exercise, a task for children, that Hinata was only nine meant little, she was the clan heiress, and should be better. On seeing her blush and faint, he activated his own Baikugan. There was only one situation that provoked that kind of reaction from Lady Hinata, whenever that demon fox boy was near. There, outside the gate, with that old man, seeing that his charge was unconscious, and the gate guards were two men he knew had no love for the Kyubi brat, he spoke to them. That demon's coming back, he's out there now, I'm going to stop him. Want to help? Two quick nods and the impromptu assassination squad assembled, stepping outside the village and vanishing. The old man had to be distracted, and that was the task before Kurai, the younger of the two guards. The older, Hatori, was the lookout and backup in case something went wrong. As they closed in, the plan started out perfectly. Kurai stepped out and threw a smoke bomb, and the old man moved after him, having let his guard down this close to Konoha, not expecting a threat from inside the village. Which he should have. Was he slipping in his old age? It was then that Hyuga Ko made his attack, a kanai in each hand. The boy had limited strength and leverage, he might have been able to hold back one arm, but certainly not two. It is said that battle plans seldom survive contact with the enemy, and Ko's hastily assembled attack lacked three very important pieces of information. First, the old man was the toad sage, with quicker reactions than most and decades more experience than his foes. Second, Naruto's new changes had given him a veritable arsenal for blunt trauma, even if he didn't extend his claws to cut his enemies. And third, Naruto had been trained by Tsunade, for whom the term, extreme blunt force trauma, was a severe understatement. As the kanai came down at speed, Naruto stepped forward, just as Shizune had drilled him, and raised both forearms in a chopping motion. Not so much an aggressive block, as a simultaneous directed blow at his attacker's elbows, which were easier to reach than his wrists, descending faster. The bone metal in the young Jinchuriki's fists and arms took the impact easily, and Ko's arms bent at the elbows, in the wrong direction, with a sickening crack. Naruto didn't stop there, unfortunately, following his taijutsu style that he and Shizune had begun to hammer out. One part monkey style, one part tiger style, and three part street fights and brawling. As Ko dropped to his knees in pain, trying in vain to clutch his arms close, Naruto's hands pushed the adult Hayuga's arms out wide, something unpleasant for Ko to say the least, and drove his head forward to impact squarely on the man's hit I ate with a sound not unlike a bell, rolling the man's white eyes back in his head as he dropped into unconsciousness. Jiraiya had rounded up the derelict guards and strode into the village with one on each shoulder, even as the blonde boy dragged his opponent into the village. It was a pity he hadn't mastered Lady Tsunade's strength augmentation yet, or he would have thrown the man. Naruto had a vague image of him in his head, and a dislike bordering on hatred. Leaving the securely bound gate guards and the incapacitated Ko, who later needed minor surgery to remove his hit I ate from his forehead, Jiraiya pointed at the nearby bench with its unconscious occupant. Naruto, you wait there while I go report this, he ordered. Naruto nodded. The difference between serious Jiraiya and regular Aero Senen was something the two of them had hashed out in short order. Keep an eye on the girl in the gate, if an invasion occurs, ask yourself what I would do. The nine-year-old boy grinned. 
pick up the girl and run, he cheeked, startling a laugh from the old man, even as he sat beside her, noticing her scent. She smelled of a garden and sunlight, he decided. It was a good scent, one he'd remember. Shaking his head, Jiraiya leapt to the rooftops and went to report. The bench was a comfortable place, and Naruto was not hard tasked by Jiraiya's directives. His thoughts wandered back to the first few days after Tsunade and Shizune had taken him in. At first he'd been fine, but then the nightmares would set in, and the snake-eyed madman would come back for him, with a set of scalpels and a giggled, can't have you running around with my property, now can we? And as the knives made their first cut he would wake from the horrors and tremble, a cold sweat covering him as he cried, screaming, why? Why did he do this to me? It had taken Tsunade and Shizune both a long time to get through to him. There was no way they could tell why Orochimaru had done this. He was insane, and obsessed with collecting jutsu, and the Keke Genke were, by definition, jutsu he couldn't have. So he wanted them even more. It was Tsunade's words that made the most sense to him though. If Orochimaru could be understood by us, truly understood, that would mean either we were as mad as he is, or that he was sane. Since he obviously isn't, maybe it's a good thing we can't understand him. He still had the nightmares, but they were less frequent, and he rarely woke up with his claws ready anymore. The blonde Jinchiriki glanced at the sleeping girl as a breeze whispered across them, and she shivered. Taking off his jacket, he laid it over the girl, and returned to his vigil, waiting for someone to come. He's that strong? Here is an asked in a serious tone. It was just bad timing on Jiraiya's part that Danzo had been here when he came to report in. The old war hawk had demanded the boy be arrested for attacking the guards, only to be shot down. They were outside the village, and approaching peacefully while playing a game, and they were attacked by our guards who'd abandoned their posts and a Hayuga ninja who abandoned his charge, the Hokage said wearily. If anyone should be punished, I believe it should be the ones who started the attack. He waved away Danzu's advice. So where is he? Jiraiya snorted, as if I'd leave the gate unguarded. He's down there keeping an eye out for us, and watching the Hayuga girl sleep. I'd get us some trusted Anbu and new guards down there quickly, were I you? Hiruzen nodded and rang the bell by his desk. His assistant poked his head through the doorway. I need Kat's Anbu team down to the gate, with a new set of guards. The current guards and Hayuga Ko are to be taken to Ibiki-san. Then send for Hitaki Kakashi, please, the Hokage said, and the other man nodded. Turning back to Jiraiya he went on, only to stumble to a halt. You'd best, get back to Naruto, he trailed off, for Jiraiya had obviously anticipated Hiruzen's orders. Hinata was warm, and felt, safe. She didn't want to open her eyes in case she had only dreamed that the boy who'd saved her was back, after six months of absence. She could however hear the argument that was going on as she sat there, with someone's jacket over her. That alone convinced her that Naruto's return was real. She couldn't think of anyone, not even Neji, who would put their own jacket over her simply because she was sleeping. Cracking one eye just a little, she could see her cousin, looking angry, as the blue-eyed boy stood between him and Ko, why was her minder for the day lying there trussed up like a chicken? She began sorting through the angry noises her cousin was making, to get the gist of the fight. Neji was in his second year at the academy, as opposed to regular schooling, and was trying to assert his non-existent authority from that. Naruto, at least she hoped it was Naruto, was having none of it. I was told to wait here and watch what's going on, he said, a little irritated by the older boy. It took me ten minutes to set that. Fools. Arms, and I'd rather you didn't cause my prisoner any more pain until after he's in tea and I, okay? The blunt nature of the words seemed to aggravate the Hayuga boy's sense of superiority. As if you could defeat a full-grown shinobi, he sneered, and again reached to release the wires. Naruto once again slapped Neji's hands away from Ko. He underestimated me, and didn't have anywhere near as much surprise as he thought. And if you do that again, I'll stop holding back. Neji paused as this boy, a year younger than he if he was any judge, made that threat. He was beginning to learn the real intricacies and art of the gentle fist style, and was already being praised as a genius, so he didn't feel threatened by anyone, and feared only those who were obviously better. What do you mean, holding back, he demanded, even as they were attracting an audience. Hinata had seen them all, children around their own age from the academy, and those who would be starting this year, gathering to watch the event. She straightened on the bench, and finally noticed the color of the jacket covering her. It was orange, with a red spiral in the center of the back and a white one on the left shoulder. It was Naruto, so startled was she, that she nearly missed Naruto's response. It was simple, but definitely effective. He turned and hammered his fist against a heavy wooden post, driving an imprint of his fist into the hard wood with an odd ringing sound. As the others watched the post, staring at the shape of Naruto's hand, she followed his motion. The impact was indeed impressive, but she saw the blonde boy wince as he shook his knuckles, even as the split skin mended. She saw it. 
Hitting the post had gotten his point across, but she could see it hurt him. Even as she stood, attracting the attention of her cousin and Naruto, the Anbu arrived, with a new pair of guards to take over the gate watch. Behind them was the toad sage who waved the blonde over. Hey, Naruto, he yelled, startling everyone except Hinata as they finally recognized the long-absent prankster that had finally returned. As they stood and stared, realizing exactly who he was, Naruto rubbed the back of his neck absently. That was the mannerism that cinched it. He looked a little different after his ordeal, and it took an old gesture to convince the other ninja cadets of his identity. Although Hinata had recognized him from the start. Um, hi, guys, he said, sheepishly. Hey, keep the jacket, Haim, I can get another one, and you look like you need it more. He darted away with the white-haired old man, even as Hinata blushed bright red. But she did put the jacket on, they noticed. It was the young Nara heir, Shikamaru, who pretty much summed up what everyone was thinking. This won't be boring, but man this is going to be troublesome. The Shinobi Academy of Konohagakure no Sato was considered to be second only to that of Kumogakure no Sato for the quality of its education, although by the rumors and intelligence Jiraiya had gathered from his new network, it was declining thanks to the civilians on the council interfering with the curriculum. As he glared at the information he'd laid out on the Hokage's desk, the older man having finally been alone for once, he pointed out the discrepancies. Shinobi history in Konoha is being edited, and quite openly, too. Did you know that none of our young cadets knew about Uzushio, let alone why the entire shinobi force above Chunin wears its symbols? He spoke in a low, forceful tone. Three years ago, a bitter Hyuga Hiyashi had seen his daughter in the jacket that Naruto had given her, a jacket too large for her at the time, that she had refused to give up. Konoha now had two ninja candidates wearing orange, and surprisingly, they made better marks in the stealth training courses than anyone else. If that's not bad enough, graduating genin candidates are only tested on three ninjutsu, and by coincidence, Jiraiya's tone did not agree with his words, being heavily laden with sarcasm. Those are the three that take the least chakra to use, even if they do require a certain amount of control. Hiruzen shook his head as he listened to his spymaster. It got worse, he knew. He'd read Jiraiya's report, and knew the relevant information, so this meeting was more of a strategy session than anything else. As things stood, Naruto, with his huge reserves and terrible control, was going to fail. That a higher number of other students were also likely to, than at any point in the past decade, pointed to a conspiracy. The written tests were horrible, but when Naruto had proven able to spot a genjutsu seal on the test papers themselves that he was given, that course of sabotage had been abandoned. If it had not been for his lack of fine control, Jiraiya was certain the young Jinchuriki would have made shinobi already. If that was his desire. Naruto sat on a log beside a public park watching the children play under the watchful eyes of their parents and minders. He was no fool, and knew they would chase him away if they could. He'd been so close to success last time he'd tried, but it was no good. No matter how hard he tried, he just didn't have the fine control he needed to use the bunch in no jutsu. His taijutsu was up to par with the others, even if he hadn't revealed his real edge, keeping his claws concealed. To the surprise of many, he'd become adept with the tanfa, wielded in each hand, as they seemed to blend with his taijutsu quite well although he'd never explain why he'd chosen them. In truth, he hadn't, but Shizune had noted on one of her trips to Konoha, Tsunade still refused to set foot in the village, even to visit Naruto, that they might be good training for when he did use his claws. It was also on one of these trips that the young medic Nin had discovered that Naruto did indeed have two Keke Jenke, his own, from the Uzumaki lineage, and the second, which had most likely come about as a result of the experiments Orochimaru had performed. It was hard to explain, but she felt he would be able to channel his chakra into the manipulation of his very bones. They were well nigh indestructible after all, and the ability to manipulate them could come in handy. So far, no luck, although they did channel chakra easily. He'd been told to ask whoever his genin squad's Janin sensei was to explain elemental natures and chakra, as the big sister figure that Shizun had become was eager to see what he'd be able to do in that area. He'd been somewhat surprised by several of his reactions to others when he'd gotten to the academy. He wasn't surprised that Sasuke had wanted to fight him a lot when they got there, and under the eye of Mizuki Sensei, the two had found themselves squared off in the sparring ring. The basic academy style was modeled on the Uchiha style, enough so that it was hard to tell the difference at times, and the Uchiha boy had been heavily tutored until that horrible night when Itachi destroyed their clan, not long after Sasuke entered the academy. Not long after the boy's first match, in fact. When Mizuki Sensei had restricted them to academy style only, Naruto had groaned inwardly. It was all wrong for his body type, he needed a fast, sweeping style, and although the academy style's straight line motions made it a good first style to learn, Sasuke had years on Naruto in the use of it. So Naruto had waited, and left the other boy an opening in his guard, which Sasuke had promptly, taken advantage, of. 
Despite the children not having forehead protectors, the forehead is quite hard, and as the Uchiha boy's fist drove past Naruto's defense, he dropped his head a fraction and took the blow on the hardest part of the skull for anyone. With his bone metal, it was even harder on Naruto. The sickening crunch as Sasuke's hand broke was clearly audible, and the academy-style kick that laid the pain-distracted boy out was textbook perfect, despite Naruto's lack of experience. If it hadn't been for his broken hand, the blonde's opponent would have been easily able to block the knee to his gut, but as it was, he went down. As the medic nin rushed over, Naruto added insult to injury as far as the Uchiha air was concerned, as he crouched down beside the other boy and helped set the bones in his hand. Naruto smiled as he recalled that day. He looked over towards the academy yard, where Sasuke brooded against the wall, despite being tagged as Rookie of the Year. He did keep demanding fights from Naruto, which the blue-eyed boy accepted or blew off as he felt necessary. The Uchiha was obsessed with getting stronger, and putting the, worthless trash, in his place. Naruto liked the place he was, thank you very much, and wasn't giving it up. He glanced over at the other boys, gathered in a group. Sometimes he'd even go along with them, but their parents were present today, as were those of everyone else, and Naruto didn't want to create friction. His gaze trailed across to the girls, where Sakura and Ino were fighting again. Before he'd been abducted, here he shuddered. A nightmare had hit him hard the night before, and he'd woken up, claws out, screaming, not her. Never her. Although he couldn't remember any of the dream except that, Naruto had been drifting towards the pink-haired girl, but the moment he'd set foot in the classroom had put paid to anything like that, as the banshee screech the girl had apparently perfected against Ino had caused his highly sensitive ears some major pain. So rather than sit anywhere near the cause of such pain, he instead took a different seat, one next to the girl he'd given his jacket to. She was actually wearing it then too. His eyes sharpened as he corrected an earlier thought. Not everyone had their parents present. Hinata's father wasn't there, or she would be over there with the other girls, but the distinct absence of the orange jacket she'd grown into, a little snug in some places, now, but she refused to part with it, pointed to her being. He sniffed the air, catching her scent. His ears twitched, although he wished they wouldn't, as it was a dead giveaway that he was focusing on his hearing, and he pinpointed where she was. There, behind that tree, about ten feet behind him and to the left. He wondered why she did that, and vaguely recalled the discussion Tsunade had had with him on his last trip to see her. Something about girls noticing boys before the boys noticed them, although he didn't fully understand it. Still, the academy years had been good, and he'd made a few friends, to an extent, and learned a lot. Tomorrow was the last day before Genin exams, an event he dreaded. Hinata, for her part, was a clever young girl. She'd managed to fight off fainting in Naruto's presence when he'd sat beside her that first day in class by remembering that she was already wearing his jacket, even if she was certain he didn't fully understand what he'd done by giving her those symbols. In Konoha, it was becoming widely assumed that the symbols simply meant you were a chunin or higher shinobi, but as part of the Hyuga, she had learned of their origins, and further, she knew what the laws surrounding clan symbols were, especially those ones. The Chunin and Jonin were permitted to wear the symbols as a sign of honor and respect, but the only others who could wear them were members of those clans. Much like the Uchiha fan becoming the emblem of the village's police force, the spirals symbolized an alliance that went back to the founding of Konoha itself. The fact that he'd given her the jacket, if he'd been aware of the full connotations, would have been a major cause for celebration, to her at least, and her family had been reassessing their position on her since she started wearing it, but she'd come to a painful decision. Before they were assigned to Genin teams, she'd have to explain the symbols. And return the jacket when he found out that handing over clan symbols like that could mean he was proposing to her. The next afternoon saw Naruto seated on the swing, listening to the triumph and spite in the hate-filled voices of most of the parents as they nearly basked in the failure of the demon. He didn't miss the smirk on Hayuga Hiyashi's face either, as he approached Hinata and spoke softly. The girl looked about to cry, which for some reason made the blonde angrier than any number of direct and slanted insults could he pushed that aside to think about later. The shadow that fell across him as he sat there belonged to the last person he'd ever have suspected. Mizuki Sensei, hearing that there was an alternate exam to graduate struck some suspicions, but Naruto was desperate to pass. I'll do it, Sensei, he said, solidifying it into a promise. There's nothing that'll stop me, believe it. Despite second thoughts, and third and fourth thoughts as well, Naruto slipped up to the Hokage Tower. The locks were quite sturdy, and the doors were solid, but this didn't slow him down by much. To all outward appearances, the door was still locked, but swift work with one of his claws through the keyhole had totally ruined the lock as a means of keeping someone out. As he stealthily moved through the halls, Naruto was thinking hard. If this was a test, then why the forbidden scroll in Hokage Tower? Surely there were better things to steal for such a test. And although he wasn't the dead last by any means, that honor had fallen to Inazuka Kiba, 
who seemed to feel he could coast by on the efforts of his partner Akamaru and the natural talents of the Inazuka, Naruto was not the fastest to learn about new jutsu, so setting that part of the test was obviously meant to pin him down in one place, out in the forest beyond the walls? Yeah, right, the more the blue-eyed Jinchuriki thought about it, the worse he suspected that something was up. His earliest teachers, Shizune, Tsunade and Jiraiya, had never mentioned this test, nor had Aruka sensei who despite his firm, no-nonsense attitude, seemed to genuinely like Naruto. Although not the ramenville the boy had run up the one time he'd made the mistake of saying, all you can eat. Most people only said that to Naruto once. So why, as Naruto disabled the security seals surrounding the scroll, he made a decision. He'd sit here and read, learning what he could, until the Hokage showed up, and explain it to him. Maybe then he could figure out something to do. Outside the tower, the Hokage was talking with his son Asuma over tea when the bandana-wearing Chunin sensei ran up to him. Toji Mizuki, he thought it was, but the man's words paralyzed the village leader. Hokage-sama, it's Naruto, he gasped out, and Mizuki was a good actor. Orochimaru's spy had contacted him about getting hold of the scroll, and felt that the demon brat would be a bonus. So that was his motivation. He's stolen the forbidden scroll of seals. The chaos that ensued was immense, and as Hiruzen gave orders, he was already in motion, heading for his office. Giving the final instruction that Naruto was to capture it alive and unharmed, instructions he'd felt bore repeating, he stepped into his office and closed the door. It took you long enough to get here, Gigi-sama, said Naruto, startling Hiruzen for a few more years off his lifespan, the old man was sure. I got bored, so I figured I'd do a little reading while I waited. As the Sandame Hokage turned, he was greeted by the sight of Naruto sitting in his chair, behind his desk, with the forbidden scroll of seals, the village's repository of kinjutsu, open before him. As Hiruzen's eyes widened, he noticed something else, something that only long experience had enabled him to spot. You're not the real Naruto, are you? He asked, although it was more a statement to confirm what he already knew. Nah, the Naruto look alike behind the desk agreed. My original felt he could learn a technique better here in your office than shivering in a shack out in the forest, but he didn't have time to learn more than one jutsu before Mizuki sensei was supposed to meet with him. So he put the scroll on his back, used the cage bunch and no jutsu, swapped the scrolls and left for the meeting, with me guarding the real scroll, not that anyone bothered checking on it, and I got bored waiting so I started reading. Although I had to look up about chakra nature and affinities, and I still don't understand it properly. Oh, and I was supposed to bring you up to date on why this is happening from my, well, my originals, end of the matter. Baruka reached the shack to find Naruto sitting there, the scroll on his back watching the forest. Seconds before the Chunin had gotten there, the shadow clone in the Hokage's office had dispersed itself, returning all the knowledge it had gathered to him, including the Hokage's approval for his little trap but he could smell Mizuki approaching and hear the man moving through the shrubbery, and didn't have time to explain. He quickly gestured to his sensei for silence, and waved for him to hide himself, his eyes pleading silently for the Chunin's trust. Amino Aruka liked the blonde boy, and thought he had huge potential as a shinobi, cage-level potential, in fact. While all his fellow teachers scoffed at the thought of the boy reaching that level, Aruka believed he could really do it, and wanted to help. When the word had gone out on the theft, he had immediately started out after the boy, hoping to convince him not to follow this path, and now he'd found him, only to find that something was definitely out of place. Trusting the boy, he hid himself in a nearby tree as his fellow teacher arrived, and he remembered that Mizuki was supposed to have been the one to have discovered the theft. But how? Mizuki wasn't supposed to have access to the Hokage's office if he wasn't sent for. Baruka paid close attention to the goings on below. There you are Naruto, Mizuki said as he stepped from the shadows of the trees. How did you go? Learn any of them? You got here too quick, Mizuki sensei, the 12 year old replied. I haven't even opened this scroll since I got here. Do you think you can give me a few tips? The traitor smirked. Apparently, the brat had had a harder time getting the scroll in the first place, and on top of that, hadn't figured out any of the jutsu, or set off any traps on the scroll itself. A pity, but surely his benefactor could get past them. I'm sorry, Naruto, but that was your last chance, he sneered. After all, you have two options, hand over the scroll and come with me, or be executed for betraying the village, as you should have been 12 years ago. Above them, Aruka almost sprang out of the tree, but hesitated at the look on Naruto's face. It was the very picture of confusion, but it was only a picture, it didn't go any deeper than the surface. The Chunin tensed, ready to act, but continued to wait. I don't understand, the boy said. Why should I have been killed back then? As Mizuki drew breath to answer, and as Aruka prepared to attack to stop him, Naruto looked Mizuki square in the eye and spoke before he could. Don't you realize that would release the Kyubi from its prison? Stunned, both Chunin, the loyal and the renegade alike, froze, even as Naruto lifted the scroll from his back with one hand and slammed it, on end, 
into the ground beside him, striking a formidable-looking pose for one so young, determination writ large in every inch of him. I know about the fox sealed inside me, sensei, he stated, and Aruka knew these words were aimed, not at Mizuki, as the renegade may have assumed, but at him. I am not the Kayubi, but its prison, its lock and its key. I stand with the will of fire, and I refuse to quit. I will never give up, I will never stop trying and I will be Hokage. I am Uzumaki Naruto, and no one can stop me. Believe it, it had begun as a verbal cry for attention, he supposed. At the tender age of three, he'd started telling others to believe it, partly to get them to believe in him, and partly to get himself to believe, to make it so that's how it would be. Now, it was a firm and solid commitment, an oath to complete what he set his word to. It was fierce, it was proud, and it was unshakable. Intimidated by a 12-year-old boy, Mizuki lost his temper. And who's going to stop me, brat? He roared, hauling one of his outsized shuriken from his back and hurling it at the boy. A dead child, a brat who shouldn't even exist. Give up and die, Baruka was too far away, and even by pushing his chakra through his legs for extra speed, couldn't stop the shuriken, or even intercept it. It didn't stop him trying, though, and so he got a point-blank, front-row center view of Naruto blocking the shuriken's path with the forbidden scroll of seals, which then puffed out of existence like a shadow clone, leaving Naruto holding the shuriken upright like a shield, and glaring at Mizuki through the hole in the middle. Your first mistake, he told the slack-jawed renegade, was forgetting that I've been trained, a little, by two of the Sanin. If there was another way to pass the genin exam, they'd have known. Your second mistake was in thinking I wouldn't ask Hokage-sama about it when he showed up in his office, despite your instructions. The whole test would have to have him know about it, as you described it, or it couldn't be real. Naruto tossed the shuriken aside and brought his hands together into a special hand sign, the fingers of one across the other. Your third mistake was betraying the village at all, it makes me furious that you thought I would go along with it. Channeling his chakra he called out, Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, and the clearing and trees were filled with what seemed to be hundreds of Naruto clones. And your last mistake was in thinking I didn't learn anything from the scroll, when all I said was I hadn't opened it since I got here. As the many clones cracked their knuckles and advanced on him, a very pale, sweat-covered Mizuki began to scream, and the screams rang out across the forest for quite some time. It was a much more subdued, as well as bruised and beaten, Mizuki who was only too happy to go peacefully with the Anbu who arrived to arrest him and although he would survive Ibiki-sama's interrogation, even if his legs never quite healed properly, oops, he would be stricken with panic at the sight of anything orange for the rest of his life. As Hiruzen arrived to speak with Naruto and Aruka about the events of that night, the blue-eyed Jinchuriki rubbed at his neck as the gibbering traitor was taken away. I think I went a little overboard, he remarked, as the Anbu commented on Mizuki's injuries. What did you beat him with, kid? One of them, in a monkey-style mask queried. In response, Naruto held up his hands, and then pointed at his forehead. Damn, next time use something like a club, kid, he's got all sorts of broken bones all over. The boy waved it off. I made sure not to hit anywhere vital, he said, and turned to the Hokage, who had finished taking Aruka's report. The old man looked at the boy, and saw his parents. They were there, in his face, his stance, his very attitude that screamed at the world. Here I stand. Come get some. He reached into his sleeve, and smiled as he withdrew the hit I ate therein. Uzumaki Naruto, he said, deliberately, with the ranking Anbu and Aruka as witnesses. Konohagakure no Sato thanks you for your service in unmasking the traitor Toji Mizuki. As this mission required you to fail your genin exam, and with the evidence before us that you are capable of such jutsu as are required, I hereby raise you to the rank of genin on my authority as Hokage. Congratulations, Naruto. He paused and then continued once Naruto had calmed down a bit. This task will be credited to you as a low-end B-rank mission, but is to be held under strictest confidence from any except your Jonin sensei and teammates. You may say you were under special orders, but not what the mission was until released to do so. Do you understand? Naruto was suddenly all business, rather than his usual self. He would probably always have problems stemming from his time as Orochimaru's captive, and as now, they would crop up as cases of extreme seriousness, beyond what anyone his age should have to endure. Hi, Hokage-sama, I understand. The dawn was breaking through the windows of his office as the prospective Jonin sensei entered with the forms to assemble their requested teams. As he looked them over he placed his hands together in front of his face steepling his fingers as he gave the official version of the previous night's events to the Jonin assembled before him. In the silence that followed, the Hokage then went on. This means that there shall be ten teams from this year's crop of Jonin, and one of them will have Uzumaki Naruto. Any questions or comments? Hitaki Kakashi cleared his throat. Despite my history, I would like to avoid having him on my team unless absolutely necessary, he said. 
I hold no grievance or grudge against the boy, he's as gutsy as they come, if a bit of a knucklehead. However, I am certain that the village council will insist that I train the Uchiha heir, and from what I've read, they get on like a house on fire. Yuhi Kuranai paused as she ran that thought through her mind. Wait, she said, isn't that a good thing? Kakashi stared at her with that one eye of his, smiling. Have you ever been in a house that's on fire, Kuranai-san? Flames, destruction, panic. I don't want to have to paint you a picture. He chuckled. I don't have enough red. The discussions were easy enough, and quickly dealt with. In some cases they were easy enough to deal with, as the teams balanced out nicely but when it came down to it, Kuranai was, less than satisfied. Lord Hokage, not to question you, but why is my request for a tracking team being turned down? She was looking at the names on her list with a pensive frown. Hiruzen glanced again at his notes. It isn't, he replied. It seemed a straightforward thing to him. Team balance and personal quirks, as well as certain traditions were taken into account, and he'd assigned the teams as impartially as possible. Then why is Inazuka Kiba on Team 7, instead of Team 8? His sense of smell is a key factor, as is his canine partner, she said. I also don't believe any good will come of having Hayuga Hinata on the same team as Uzumaki, either. She has a crush on him, and can barely remain conscious in his presence. The Hokage again looked over his notes. Reports from the academy place her as improving in that regard. The constant exposure to her friend seems to be improving her self-confidence by leaps and bounds. Are you saying that's a bad thing? Again, Kuranai gathered her wits and argued. When Uzumaki failed the academy test, she began. At my orders, the Hokage reminded her, lying through his teeth. Hi, Hokage-sama, she responded automatically, but struggled on with her argument. That automatically made him the, dead last, of this year's group, so he should be paired with the rookie of the year, for balance. Inazuka Kiba should be on my tracking team, as his tracking abilities are superior to Uzumaki's. Hiruzen filled his pipe and lit it, savoring a couple of puffs of smoke as he pondered how to answer. He wondered why Kuranai was so set against the boy being in her team, and recalled her protectiveness toward the Hayuga girl. Was it as simple as that? From the observations and reports he'd received, the Inazuka boy was interested in the Hayuga heiress, who didn't reciprocate his feelings, so her virtue was safe there, but if her interest in Naruto was returned, and with the closeness of their friendship as it was, being on the same team may well be the push that started such a romance. He grinned as he got an idea, one that even Naruto, incorrigible prankster that he was, would have loved. Give him a test, then. He watched as Kuranai gaped at him. Give Naruto a task that you know Kiba can manage, or make it a contest between the two of them, with no outside assistance, not even young Kiba's partner. If Naruto performs well enough in your honest opinion, no deceiving yourself, please, it's bad enough when others do it, he stays on your team. If he loses to Kiba, he can transfer to Team 7 with my blessing. What do you say, Kakashi, the copycat ninja, Sharingan Kakashi, put away his copy of Icha Icha Paradise. Can I put 20 Ryo on Naruto? 